Um, the only announcement that I have is if you have Facebook, we're sharing more on our wall. So if you could repost from our wall, the church's wall, that would help us get our name out there and get ourselves free advertising. Any others? Josiah. <laughs> Today, I adapted today's prayer from one found on the Revised Common Lectionary site from Vanderbilt Divinity Library. Won't you please pray with me? Holy and gracious one, long ago, faithful women proclaimed the good news of Jesus' resurrection, and the world was forever changed. Teach us to, give, to keep faith with them, that our witness may be as bold, our love as deep, and our faith is true. Amen.
The flowers are very beautiful. Thank you. I, I was trying to get that on the uh, Zoom a little more because of the bottom row, I don't think it's really showing, but it's very beautiful. The title of the message is Roll Away the Stone. And I'm going to read in Mark, Mark 16, 1 through 8. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene, Magdalene and Mary the mother of James and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint Jesus' body. Very early in the, on the first day of the week, just after sunrise, they were on their way to the tomb and they asked each other, Who will roll away the stone from the entrance of the tomb? But when they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, had been rolled away. And they entered the tomb. And they saw a young man dressed in a white robe, sitting at the right side, and they were alarmed. Don't be afraid, he said. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where he, they laid him? But go and tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee, and there you will see him, just as he told you. Trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb, and they said nothing to anyone, because they were afraid. I'd like to start by uh, reviewing uh, the events of Good Friday, from Good Friday, or not Good Friday, from uh, uh, the beginning of uh, the week, of Holy Week. And I want to uh, start, and I'm going to use Luke, and I'm just going to read a few headlines, Palm Sunday. And so last Sunday we left Jesus riding a donkey into Jerusalem and having a, a, a welcoming committee. Jesus the next day clears the temple, that's when he goes in and upsets the tables. The next, uh, following that, the religious leaders challenge Jesus' authority. Jesus tells the parable of the evil farmer. The religious leaders question Jesus about paying taxes. <clears throat> religious leaders question Jesus about the resurrection. Religious leaders cannot answer Jesus' question. Jesus warns them against religious leaders, the poor widow gives all she has, Jesus tells about the future, he tells about his return, he tells about remaining watchful, and then his death and resurrection, Judas betrays Jesus, Jesus and his disciples are, uh, share the Last Supper, Jesus predicts Peter's denial, Jesus agonizes in the Garden of Gethsemane. Jesus is betrayed and arrested. Peter denies knowing Jesus. The council of religious leaders condemn Jesus. Jesus stands trial before Pilate. Jesus stands trial before Herod. Pilate hands Jesus over to be crucified. Jesus is led away and crucified. Jesus is placed on the cross and Jesus dies and is laid in the tomb and Jesus raised from the dead, and then he appears. So, Easter Sunday is a time in which we celebrate and remember. We celebrate our past with candy and Easter baskets and chocolate rabbits and colored eggs and jelly beans, and of course, them yellow marshmallow chicks. I never could quite understand why eating up the ears off of a rabbit and eating a yellow marshmallow chick seemed to be a good thing to do on Easter. I wasn't raised with any of that. I understand the symbolic meaning and where it comes from, and from Mass and all of that. And I understand uh, about eating candy as a celebration. The empty tomb also has a lot of meaning. All these events took place some 2,000 years ago and still have long-term meaning and affects the world then, today, and into the future. We can understand many teachings of Jesus. We may not have great difficulty in that, <clears throat> or at least we have a viewpoint, or one that we hold on to and we understand. 
But the empty tomb is the one thing that I believe, and I see as we have the most difficulty to wrap our minds around and understand. The resurrection of Jesus. In today's reading, the women were shocked at the empty tomb being empty. The men came later. <clears throat> the empty tomb is the one event in Christianity that makes a difference between all others. It's the resurrection. Paul preached the resurrection, and that was his main point. It was the good news for Paul. And for many of us, it should be the beginning of a long line of theological perspectives. <coughs> An event at the time that affects our lives, and that when we pass from this life to the next, and how we see this empty tomb is how we view, uh, hold our view, our theological views, as death and dying in our next life, and the sequence of events. <coughs> There's many. Before this event, most people's souls slept. They went to Sheol, the underworld, the bosom of Abraham, and so forth. No one believed, uh, uh, generally, that they went to heaven or paradise or to be with God. Maybe some of the kings. How one allows this event, the empty tomb, to come into, into our minds, into our hearts, it's different, to say the least. It's always been that way, right from the very beginning. There has always been many different beliefs. Matthew 28, 11 through 15, the chief, chief priest bribed the soldiers to tell a story that someone came to God Jesus' body. And it's been that way ever since. There's a variety of viewpoints. I'm not going to get into them today. But the resurrection of Jesus is the center point of Christianity. But I also believe that forgiveness is right there with the resurrection. And so I want to look at the passage in Luke in which when Jesus was placed on the cross and he said these three things. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they are doing. Truly, I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise to the thieves. Or to the thieves, depends what you believe. Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I want to look at these things a little bit and see how they pertain to us and how we view them. Because they are very important as far as I'm concerned. Jesus says, forgive them. Who is them? Is it just the people standing in front of them? Just the believers, the future believers? Or is it the world? How do you understand them? And Jesus is on the cross and he looks out across there and he says, forgive them. And there's a whole list of people that did all kinds of nasty things in, 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 uh, uh, in this event. <coughs> Excuse me. And Jesus is looking out across there and saying, forgive them. For they don't know what they're doing. Who does that pertain to? How do you see them words? Is that a total forgiveness? Or is that limited forgiveness? Or as some uh, in future uh, theological verb, uh, 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 puts forth it, is that, of course Jesus knew it was only the chosen and God's elect. I don't believe that, but that's okay. That's how it's done. They move ahead and then come back. Today you will be with me in paradise. How do we see that? Do we see that only pertaining to the one thief? Or is Jesus looking out across and moving his head around and saying, today you will be with me in paradise? He starts with the, the, one, with the, the, the one thief and turns his head. What we are missing in the story, as far as I'm concerned, is the non-spoken words by a movement or a look, which we looked at uh, several messages ago, the power of the look. We don't know how Jesus is looking as he is saying these things. Which to me has a lot to do with how you understand these things. Traditionally it's thought that the, the only thief that, uh, that Jesus was referring to as today he will be living in paradise is the one who confessed and said, hey, I've done things wrong. I'm not sure that is the case. This is the complexity of this story. 
or of these events? Do we read the Bible just too literally and forget that there is non literal language involved in it by the looking, the expression? How do we incorporate that into that? I think it has a lot to do with how you understand the text. A lot of this, how you understand these things, have a lot to do with how the idea of the empty tomb reflects into your heart and into your mind. Do you see the graves as being empty or emptied at, in Jesus' time? Or is it a future event to come sometime in the event? Uh, event uh, uh, a general resurrection into the future. There's a lot of theological perspectives. You, you have the rapture, you have uh, various different things that come that, that are put forth in today's uh, uh, theological perspective and denominations. How do you see this event? How do you see the event in which Jesus did right here, right now, in which we start to celebrate? Is it a limited event or is, a, is it a, an earthly event? I tend to think that it's an earthly event, a, a, a global event. It affects all of humanity, not just some. I, I don't necessarily believe that there is, I, I believe when we move from this life to the next, it's a continuity. There is no re resurrection in the sense that uh, it was in the past. This argument of, or discussion of resurrection, whether it happened uh, 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 at the time of Jesus when he died and resurrected, and that it was a future event, happened very, a discussion of that happened very early in the church. Paul had that discussion, and he said that don't listen to them that say that the resurrection had already happened. Paul thought it was a, a future event. I don't always agree with Paul. Some things I like about Paul and some things I don't. Some things I think Paul reflects too much into his Jewish background and brings it forward too much. <coughs> Excuse me. And I think this is one of them. He believed that the resurrection was going to happen very nearly in the future, that the return of Jesus was going to come very soon. But I tend to believe that uh, according to Matthew's account, uh, that the graves were opened, and when Jesus died, and the temple veil was rent, and people saw people come out of the grave and walk into the next uh, into the next round. I believe that's when the resurrection happened. I don't think at this particular time that we sleep in the grave and it's a later event. This is a theological perspective, and I understand that. And you can, I'm not saying how you want to believe. For me, I see that Jesus stopped that, and now there's continuity. You pass from this life, you are straight through, and you are conscious again. There is no soul sleep, no lag time, no, there's a continu continuity. You go to your, see your ancestors that are alive and well, somewhere in heaven and paradise. And I know that's affecting somebody here that's sitting here today that lost a loved one. There is continuity, and this is the power of the cross and the power of the resurrection. If you believe it's a future event, then what did Jesus do? It happened, and it's happening, and there's continuity. We talked about it in Isaiah 34, or 43, and Hebrews again brings it up, a, 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 a prophecy in which there was a time coming when uh, God would not remember our sins no more, and he would blot them out. I see that as this time. This time when Jesus came, he lived his life, he died on the cross, and he resurrected. Our sins are blotted out and not remembered no more. Not in God's eyes. When Jesus said, Father, I commit into your hands my spirit, what is he saying? He's saying that my body is here and my spirit is going there. He's not saying, I'm, Father, take my body with me and redo it. He said, the body is going into the grave and my spirit is going through with you, God the Father. That, I believe, is what happens to us as we pass from this life to the next. There is continuity straight through. They say three days it takes for the process. I don't know. I haven't passed that yet. I don't know. 
And when I do, maybe I'll come back and give you a flashing tree. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but this is, this is said by uh, those who maybe have experienced it or had a near-death experience and come back and they say it takes three days to move in this process. As Jesus was in the grave three days, so we travel to three days. But time is irrelevant. At that time, I think time is certainly different. That's for sure. I think how you see the empty tomb affects what, how you go to pass from this life to the next. How you understand all that. When Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. I have people who take and move that apostrophe over and say, today I am telling you that sometime in the future you're going to be with me in paradise. But that's not how it is written. Jesus is saying to the thief on the cross, today, meaning that day. This is a, another uh, theological perspective and argument. That is, they, they take future understandings and bring it back and back apply it, which I think is wrong. Jesus said, today there is continuity. Today is different. Today you will be with me. And Jesus died that day, and thus the thief in the cross would be there. The question then again arises, is it both the thieves? Or is it just the one? Does the Father forgive them for the do not know cover both these or just the one? Does it simply cover the believers, the chosen, the God's elect? Or does it cover all? It covers all, from my perspective. All. There's too many times that the word all is used. You can't just throw the word all out. You have to include that into your theological perspective. The psalmist, David, he was worried at the time when he was living because he knew he was going to soul sleep and go to the bosom of Abraham and he was worried that God would forget about him and leave him there forever. And he didn't like that idea. Psalm 1610, Acts 25 says the same thing. He was concerned about his soul staying there forever, but he said he knows that sometime in the future God is going to do something different and she always going to be opened up and we are going to be set free. King David believed that it was going to be a future event. At death, Jesus is said to have, in, in Matthew's account, I think that's what it is, that he went down to the underworld and to Sheol and ministered to the captives. Later, Peter and Paul, uh, I think it's Peter, says that he went down there and set them free. So what does this mean? Do we so sleep? Is Sheol still alive and well? Do people go to the underworld? No, I don't think so. Again, it depends on what you want to believe and how you want to understand it. And most times, and I'll boldly step on this, is because you want to have an advantage. There is built into a lot of theology so that I have, or this group has an advantage over this group. Just start studying, you'll soon find that out. That's built into a lot of theology. I don't like it, I speak against it. In the parameters, Father forgive them, for they do not know what they do are doing, we are forgiven, the world is a globe, it's forgiven. First Corinthians, Paul talks about the body has to be put into the ground so a new life can come up. He uses the analogy of a seed. The seed that you plant in the ground rots and a new plant comes up. He's using that analogy to say about life, eternal life. You put the body into the ground, a new body comes up. The one that you plant is not the one you harvest. So what does he mean? It means that the body that we have, we have to shed in order to be set free. This is what happened in the empty tomb. There is no more underworld. There is no more Sheol. Yes, the women were the first to see the tomb. And the importance of this cannot be overlooked, which it is many times. 
There is a thread of the feminine that runs the whole way through the Bible that is overlooked by the masculine tremendously. I am against that. I think both serve a very important part, and if I would probably choose one or the other, I think the feminine is probably a little more important than the male part. I'm sorry, I have to, I have, just have to agree with that. But I'm going to have to go disagree with something that was posted this week, that they were the only ones that didn't desert Jesus. I understand what is being said. I'm not disagreeing that was the importance of women, but unfortunately, that is not a true statement. Because Joseph, who was a member of the council, Joseph of Arimathea, <laughs> yeah, he knows what I'm talking about. Joseph of Arimathea, it finally says in Luke, was an upright man who had not consented to their decisions or actions. And he's the one who went to Pilate and got Jesus' body and put it into his newly formed tomb and put it in there and wrapped it in a cloth. And uh, it also, uh, the Nicodemus, John includes Nicodemus in there too. So I have to say the importance of the feminine is very important. No problem. But I can't say that they're, they're the only ones that did not deserve. Joseph of Arimathea was a very important person in this whole thing. He risked his life as a Jewish person and a Jewish leader amongst his own fellow Jewish leaders to go to Pilate and to argue and to want to take Jesus' body down. He risked his life to do that. And he took it, wrapped it, and put it in the grave. As I am coming to a close, is the empty tomb just for us, not them? Is it for, is it for those people and not for us? Or is it them? Or is them all of humanity? We are all set free by the open tomb. Because now there's continuity. We're not going into Sheol, into the underworld. We are forgiven. There's a certain sense of freedom knowing that. I have a freedom or a, a, an expression of freedom knowing that I'm not going to soul sleep and go into the other world and be semi-conscious or all that stuff that happened in the past. I'm not going to have continuity. Life goes on, continues on. The work of Jesus for the world, he says it is finished. He done did it. How would he say it's finished if it's not finished, if it's a future event? Yes, we all have to experience death and, and carry through. But the process is finished, the way I see it. When Jesus says it is finished, then it is finished. It's not a future, something else that God has to do is finished. We now are forgiven. Yes, this is a whole theological argument that, that we must uh, accept it on all, all of those things. But that's not necessary. That, that's just all part of the process. That's some of the process. That's a slice of bread in, the, in the, the, the whole loaf. Yes, I would agree that this is the best thing to do, to live your life as good as you can. And to believe. But sadly, not everybody does. Or they believe differently. There's no question about it. Everybody, uh, many people believe differently, right from the very beginning. And I think that's okay. The complexity of difference is a healthy way of doing it. If we all believed the exact same thing, it would be boring as all get out. There is tension and there is growth in different. We are all forgiven. And the tomb stands open. Amen.
This is the time of our communion. Everyone is welcome. If you don't have one, there's some in the back. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he took a loaf of bread and he broke it. And he said to his disciples, Eat all of you, for this represents my body broken for all. May our sins be forgiven. And again, Jesus took the chalice and he poured some wine into it. And he said to his disciples, Drink all of you, for this is my life poured out and given for all. A new life. Help us, O oh God, to live this new life. We are commanded by Jesus as often as we eat this meal to remember and to reflect on God's goodness and mercy. In God's Holy Spirit, we are to share this meal together as we gather until the time we can eat this meal. Each one face to face with our Lord. You may partake.
for the many blessings that you give us. We give our gifts today knowing that you are doing new things in your world. Use for your works and help us to catch the vision of the new works you are doing. Amen. concerns? I have a joy. In the, the beginning of the year, I had a nephew-in-law that fell and up a ladder and had a head injury. He is now home and is doing very well. And I also have a great, great, a great niece born today. Yeah. <laughs> and the person you were talking about, I didn't catch, was a head injury? Uh, like, uh, Lisa's husband. Lisa's husband, okay. In North Carolina. Okay, I was, we're just thankful that he's doing well. Yeah. And, and I'm really glad to see you both. Thank you. It's really glad to see you, and, and uh, Lena, it's great. Things are starting to move a little bit better in a different direction. Maybe we'll start seeing some different people uh, coming back again. But, well, you know I have something to say, Kelvin. Yes, you do. Mom passed away. If I look different, it's because I lost my hair with the medicine I've taken for MS. Your hair looks wonderful, like I told you. You know, it looks wonderful. It looks, it's no... very short. I've never had this short in my life. That's not a concern or nothing. It's a blessing because she had been bleeding and she was losing so much blood. They gave her eight pints of blood within two weeks. Six of it was in, within one week. Her kidneys were failing. The GFR was down to eight. Um, you can't live on that. And um, part of your sermon, Calvin, I got to tell you, is really hit me because well, as mom was dying, there was a part when she was laying there, and all of a sudden she raised up her body and held out her arms and held out her hands. And then she went back down. Yes, she was still going through the thing. But she did do that. Like, here I am, take me. So. There's that continuity that goes. I, there's many, many stories like that. Different kinds I, of stories. I've never seen it before. I didn't see it with my father, but I sure seen it with my mother. I was with my dad when he passed away. I didn't see it with him. But mom, she put her arms out and she raised up her body like she was ready to go into the another world. Even though her heart was still beating, even though everything was still going on until it was to the end. So, I mean, that really has to, you know, the nurse was with me and she says, she's going to heaven. It's, it's a wonderful, I think, I think sometimes we don't realize the power of this story, of the resurrection. We don't realize the power of that story. And, and then when we're faced with, with moments like you have, 
then it becomes all so real. You know, I mean, it's such a blessed event. It really is. It's it is a blessed event that the nurse mom isn't living through feeling so weak anymore. She's not going through the pain that she's been going through for three weeks. She's not going through having to put up with medicine, having to put up with breathing machines. Not, she wasn't on a respirator, she was only on a BiPAP. But if I wanted to kept her on that, when I took, I'm sorry to be taking over. That's okay. But when they went and they took her off the medicine, the change in her heart rate was out of this world. You wouldn't have believed how far it went down and how close she was to passing on. And when they took her out the BiPAP, she woke up enough and I called my sister and she got to talk to Mary, my sister. I, some of you know her from the dinners, but she told Mary that she loved her. You know, she couldn't say too many words, but she said, I love you to Mary. And I called Dwayne and she said, I love you to Dwayne and Dwayne responded. And I tried to call Betty, of course I didn't get her, but you know, that's here nor there. But she did have her time where she could tell everybody her goodbyes and that she loved them. She was blessed. Which was awesome. I mean, she was strong. You gotta give her that. She was strong. Gammed up. So it was a blessed past. It was very blessed. Very blessed. Any others? Wow. Alvin? Can, uh, I, I have some joys. It's a joy to have Josiah's music in our service. And it's such a joy to have you, Calvin, uh, to come over every Sunday. I know you spend a good part of your week preparing and uh, you came from a very conservative background clear up to us <laughs> we're we're i think pretty liberal uh people don't like that word but i do <laughs> and it's a special joy to have shane shane makes it possible for me and annie and uh i don't know if jerry's here today but for us to be able to be there every sunday but especially on easter and Shane for doing the bulletin and the wonderful graphic that he picked today with the empty crosses and he is risen. And Calvin, thank you so much for the inspiring message and for all the research that you put in through the week um, <laughs> while you're still you know, earning a living. Thank you so much, everybody who makes this possible. And for those of us who can't be there in person, still to be there. Thank you. You're welcome, Jane. Bob. Cynthia seems to be recovering nicely. And so uh, our prayers have been answered in terms of her, we hope. Yeah, I, I, was, I was glad to hear the text that you or the email or whatever it was, whatever platform you use to communicate to me. Thank you. Any others? Connie. I got went to the doctor this last week and had some x-rays done. My neck, I've got several issues going with it right now. And we have to make about pain management, possibly surgery, none of which I want. I, I'll, I'll pray for uh, a, a good decision. Any others? Let us join our hearts and minds together. Thank you, oh God. Thank you for giving us the freedom, the freedom to, uh, of our spirits, 
and also a country in which we can express ideas and thoughts, help us to love one another who think differently. It's difficult sometimes to understand why people think differently, but it is all in the fruitfulness of learning and growing. We ask you to be with our church as we move forward and out of this COVID uh, pandemic, help us to make good decisions as we move forward. We pray that the churches in general will all make you know, good decisions, good decisions. It's different for different churches and different denominations. Help us as we make these choices and decisions. Be with our government as it is moving forward. Time never stands still. The arrow of time always keeps moving forward. We ask you to be with our president, President Biden, Kamala Harris, the vice president. Be with them as they make decisions that affect us all. There's a lot of uh, struggle and tension as uh, we work out these decisions. Help us to put good faith forward in making these decisions. I have to be with Jerry wherever he is at on this day. I have to be with Linda, and Amber, and Billy, especially Amber as she takes care of Linda and Amber and Amber Billy. We're especially appreciative of the people who came here for this day, we haven't seen in a while, or just be with them as they make decisions and travel back and forth. Lord, be with Leota, who mentioned a, a person who had a head, head injury and is doing better, we thank you. She is one of the people we're very thankful to see. Lord, just be with her great nephew, Thank you. Life is precious and it moves on. Lena, who is here with us, who is, who has uh, just has lost her mother. Lord, we will call it a blessed passing. Yes, there is a lot of um, mourning that goes on, but also. At some point, it becomes blessed in the passing. Ina is now with you. We will miss her. Lord, just be with the family as they go through this time. Cynthia, with the great news that she is recovering well, be with her and the doctors as they move forward. Be with Meg and family as they I'm sure are very thankful in this time of year. We thank you. We ask you to be with Connie as she is seeking wisdom from her doctors to move forward with medications. Be with all of them as they make these decisions. Many of us have medical issues that we deal with, decisions that have to be made and changed along the way. We are thankful for the doctors and nurses and healthcare workers, all the people who dedicate their lives to make our lives better. The technology, the ongoing understanding of the COVID, what we are going to learn and apply. Lord, we are thankful for the science and the scientists. Be with the law enforcement <coughs> as they move forward. There's many issues that I can pray and pray and pray. Lord, just lift them up. We're thankful for the technology that allows people who are in great distances away from this church to worship with us, be with Annie, Jeannie, and those who are on the Zoom. We're thankful for Josiah's music. Each Sunday, he works and prepares. Lord, just be thankful. I am also thankful for this church to be a part of it. Thank you for leading me to this place. Lord, we don't always say and do the things we should. Help us to appreciate the resurrection. For at some time we all are going to pass from this life to the next. 
Thank, thank you for what you have done and you look after humanity in ways that we don't always acknowledge. We ought to live our lives as flourishing as we can. But may we pause at times and take in the beauty of it all. We ask this in Jesus' name. Join me now in the Lord's Prayer. Loving God in heaven, hallowed is your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, the power, the glory, forever. Amen. Please stand if you can for the benediction. May the God of love and peace be with you in the days ahead. Go in peace. Amen.